enjoyed your lunch um, very much, and I suggest that um, I, uh, we open our discussion in panel three. Panel two. Panel two, I'm sorry, uh, um, on, under the title of the Cold War Era Search for a Self-Reliant Security Posture in Seoul and Pyongyang. We have uh, two presenters and two discussants. Uh, Professor Sang Yun Ma is now assistant professor at the Catholic University in Seoul, Korea. Uh, he obtained a PhD in international politics uh, from Oxford University. And uh, we have um, Catherine Weatherspy. Uh, she is well known to you. So do I need a um, uh, repeated introduction? No, no. And uh, we have, um, um, as discussant, uh, Mr. Robert Wemplow, the research fellow, National Security Archive. He obtained a PhD from the Harvard University. And um, we have <coughs> uh, Dr. Gong Dan Ho, who is now the research staff member of the Institute for Defense Analysis. And uh, his PhD in Asian Studies, University of California, Berkeley. And uh, he has been well known to Washington and West Coast. So now I would like to invite Dr. Ma uh, to make his presentation. Thank you, Ambassador Sun. Uh, I'm glad to have an opportunity to present a paper in this prestigious uh, institution. I actually studied a uh, U.S.-Korea relationship from my uh, doctoral studies at the uh, University of Oxford. I wrote on a thesis uh, which deals with uh, American policy towards South Korea, especially regarding uh, what was American policy uh, with the question of democracy and dictatorship in South Korea. And I dealt with uh, uh, the period from 1960 to 1968. And therefore, my presentation today is kind of a sequel uh, to my uh, PhD uh, dissertation. Uh, the topic which I'm trying to well, present today is South Korean security policy. And with special uh, reference to the alliance and the question of a self-reliance as well. Uh, as we already have uh, discussed in the previous session, it is commonly argued and, well, believed that there are some kind of contradictions between alliance and self-reliance. In other words, if a government is trying to be self-reliant, then its, rela its alliance relationship with other countries should be a little bit or more or less weakened. 
But the argument I'd like to make today is that the South Korean government under uh, President Park Jong-hee pursued the both aims. In other words, the South Korean government wanted to maintain its alliance relationship with the United States, tact, at the same time to be reliant, to be self-reliant. This argument is based on two case studies. The first one, uh, even though there are some overlaps with uh, uh, the paper uh, presented in the previous session, the, the first case I dealt with is the uh, negotiation between uh, Seoul and Washington just after the uh, Pueblo instance and the Blue House raid that occurred in 1968. The second case I dealt with is another negotiations between the two governments uh, for the U.S. Uh, withdrawal of troops from South Korea that took place, those well, negotiations took place between, uh, from 1970 uh, to 1971. Uh, I wrote about the, the first uh, case under the heading of the, the emergence of self-reliance, and the second one with the subtitle of responding to Nixon Doctrine. Okay. One of my, well, supporting arguments that the, uh, the, the security policy of the South Korea was not against, not alliance against self-reliance, but, well, the pursuit of self-reliance at the same time, the pursuit of alliance. Uh, I like to point out, point out that the self-reliance and the pursuit of self-reliance of the uh, Park Jong-hee government at the time was a strategic response to the prospect of U.S. disengagement from Korean affairs. Then, a nationalist policy initiative uh, which aimed at restoring uh, the somewhat, uh, well, uh, re restoring uh, the incomplete national sovereignty uh, of South Korea. Let me give you an example why the self-reliance was just a uh, strategic response. Uh, in February 1968, uh, Park Jong-hee, President, South Korean President Park Jong-hee, began for the first time to pronounce his policy and his uh, policy of self-reliance. This, well, pronouncement was a reaction uh, immediately to uh, to the uh, January incidents, I mean the Blue House raid and the, the seizure of USS Pueblo. The details of the story was already presented in the previous section, so I, I don't think I need to repeat it. These two incidents uh, have an effect that uh, Seoul's uh, confidence in U.S. security commitment to Korea uh, decli was declined. But I have to mention, I think, uh, that uh, even before the January incidents, Park Jong-hee and his assistants uh, had a um, uh, doubt whether doubt about uh, U U.S. Uh, continuing U.S. Uh, well, provision providence of security uh, help, sec security assistance to the country. Because the reason for that was the, uh, related to the issues of Vietnam War. South Korean government and President Park Jong-hee himself uh, believed that uh, his decision and actions to send South Korean troops to Vietnam in 1965 for the first time, was a kind of strategic barter for the continuation of U.S. military presence in the South Korea. Therefore, as long as the Vietnam War goes on, it went on, uh, Park Jong-hee could felt a little bit assured that the American support for South Korean defense will 
remain. But however, uh, in from the early 1968, uh, Park Chung-hee began to doubt whether doubt about the U.S. commitment to the Vietnam War, to commitment to the uh, defense of the South Vietnam. Therefore, Park Chung-hee's pronouncement of self-reliance policy for the first time in uh, 1968, fe February 1968, had the background of his Park Chung-hee's and South Korean government's uh, kind of a deep doubt about U.S. commitment, and this doubt was even deepened with the Janu two January incidents. Okay, now I just uh, said that self-reliant became the uh, goal of the South Korean government from the February 1968. The second question I'd like to mention then is how the South Korean government tried to become self-reliant, the question of how, question of strategy. Here, the, my main argument that, uh, that alliance for self-reliance is to be struck out. Actually, President Park Jong-hee clearly recognized the need of U.S. economic, military, and technical support. He needed those support in order to be self-reliant. Uh, South Korea at the time was still a very uh, poor country without uh, many uh, much uh, resources to, in their hands. Therefore, alliance with the United States was the only remaining sources they can utilize for uh, being becoming self-reliant. Park Chung-hee government tried a hard bargain, therefore, with the aim of getting as much as U.S. support as possible. In 1968, in the negotiation right after the January incidents, the South, South Korean government deliberately raised the U.S. concern about South Korea's unilateral retaliatory actions against North Korea. I think this is really important because normally, uh, well, it is argued that South Korea really wanted to strike back. But when the U.S. military, the U.S. government refused South Korean request of re retaliatory action, South Korean government, well, instantly concluded there would be no American help in that regard. And subsequently, the second goal emerged. That is, that was to extract as much as U.S. US support in assisting the, well, the pursuit, the South Korean pursuit of self-reliance. That did work in some part. I will talk about it later. In 1970, uh, regarding the negotiations uh, for uh, the, the pulling out of U.S. forces from South Korea, Park Jong-hee simply refused to start negotiation with the United States. By doing this, however, as the second best aim for the South Korean government, the Seoul also intended to maximize U.S. assistance. Uh, if you look at uh, page uh, 19 to 20, uh, I quote uh, Park Jong-hee's uh, instruction to the ministries of uh, national, national Defense and Foreign Ministry. Uh, according to a documents I found in the uh, Korean Foreign Ministry's archive, Park Jong-hee instructed two things. 
the first one is satisfactory guarantee on the modernization of South Korean armed forces. And secondly, firm assurance of no further reaction, reduction of US forces after the, re the first reduction of the US forces, US troops. Only when these two conditions were met, Park Chung hee said, instructed, get on with the talks about the size, ways, and timing of the reduction, as well as the re relocation of units after the reduction. Therefore, uh, these, well, this instruction indicates strongly that Park Chung hee suggested to the United States that two preconditions for troop reductions. <coughs> and so we can also in, uh, say that these two preconditions were what really the South Korean government pursued at the time. What are those two preconditions mean? The fourth thing, to maintaining the alliance with the United States. And second thing, getting many massive well, American support for the modernization of the South Korean Army and Navy and Air Forces. So these two instructions gave us a clear idea that Park Jong-hee and his government wanted alliance as well as self-reliance. The South Korean strategy of driving a hard bargain was partly successful. After, uh, well, President Johnson's uh, special envoy, Cyrus Vance, went to uh, Seoul for meetings with uh, President Park in 1968. Uh, and after the long, very hard bargaining between, the, between Seoul and uh, Washington uh, for the withdrawal of uh, 20,000 U.S. troops from Korea, in both cases, uh, were ended with the result that substantial U.S. aid package for the modernization of Korean forces were brought out. Therefore, uh, it is quite safe that we can say that uh, South Korean bargaining strategy was quite successful. But I'd like to, well, confine the success as a kind of a part, partly successful one. Because not all the Korean demands were met. For example, uh, for the uh, negotiation that took place in 1970 and 71, no guarantee, uh, no, well, about US, no other, uh, no further US troop reduction would take place were given to the South Korean government. In other words, uh, Washington simply rejected uh, South Korean demands for uh, that kind of guarantee. And secondly, uh, even though the Nixon administration uh, promised uh, a massive uh, US assistance for the modernization of the South Korean armed forces, uh, US promise of uh, that assistant were not met in the subsequent years. Uh, well, in 1972 and three uh, in, in fiscal years, uh, the because of the uh, US congressional uh, actions, uh, the, the Nixon administration's request for the uh, aid uh, allocation uh, for South Korea reduced drastically. And that makes the administration uh, hard to uh, live with its promise for the assistance to the uh, South Korean government. Because of that, Park became more determined to pursue self-reliance. And he wanted to be less affected by the volatility of US policy, which 
is well in many parts re related to the domestic politics of the United States. And from that time on, uh, Park Chung Hee even uh, strengthened his uh, pursuit of self reliance. In late 1971, he ordered uh, his government to uh, initiate a uh, long range program to develop defense industries. And in 1972, around the time, he also ordered development of missiles, missiles and nuclear programs as well. But however, I also wanted to st uh, stress that Buck's, Park Jung his conviction of conviction that alliance and self-reliance did not contradict it with, with each other didn't change it. Regardless of Park's intention, however, there were some side effects of South Korean strategy to extract uh, massive American support. First, in the negotiations that took place in 1968, Americans were very much concerned about the possibility uh, the Bak government would uh, strike North Korea unilaterally without uh, the American uh, well support. And therefore, uh, the Johnson administrations embarked on a policy review on South on Korea, and they uh, formulated a new policy, which initiated uh, disengagement from Korean affairs. And therefore, it might be said that uh, Park's, Park Park Hee government's uh, bargaining tactics, in a sense precipitated the process of even if not just caused uh, the the policy shift in Washington towards Seoul. And secondly, during the bargaining process, Americans and also this, the, the Korea, South Koreans began to doubt even more severely about the uh, confidence, mutual confidence between the allies. In the final analysis, however, I might have to say that it is unfair to attribute the weakening of mutual confidence only to Park Jong-hee and his government. As I concluded in my paper, the Nixon administration wittingly or unwittingly made South Korean leaders feel betrayed by changing its policy towards South Korea unilaterally. During the process of negotiation leading to the pullout of uh, U.S. forces from South Korea in 1971, uh, American Vice President Spiro Agnew uh, visited Seoul for uh, talks with uh, President Park. In one occasion, uh, Vice President Agnew uh, tried to persuade uh, uh, South Korean help cooperation, arguing and pointing out that the most important characteristics of American diplomacy, diplomacy and it, its history uh, is the credibility. However, with the benefit of hindsight, we really come to wonder whether a South Korean president who was a realist, hard-headed realist, could have believed the Spiral Agnews persuasion at the time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Ma, for your presentation. Uh, I think at this point uh, I have to say something about the definition of uh, self-reliant defense capabilities. I, I think this, uh, in countries like South Korea, um, the term self-reliant 
uh, defense is very much um, nationalism uh, oriented. So our English dictionary may be different from your uh, American uh, English dictionary, you see. And then at the beginning of uh, Nomuyan government of South Korea, uh, he emphasized time and again that um, self-defense, self-reliant defense. But in the face of increasing criticisms, uh, they changed the terminology to um, cooperative uh, self-reliant defense. That means self-reliant defense on the basis of alliance with Americans. So uh, I don't think uh, this terminology is um, logical itself. Anyway, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Catherine Weathersby on the North Korea's efforts to acquire uh, nuclear weapons technology in 1960s. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I said this morning that the uh, the alliance dilemma has been more acute for Korea than it has uh, for both Koreas than it has for many other countries that are engaged in an alliance with um, a stronger power. Um, and then I would add to that that I think the alliance dilemma has been more acute for North Korea than it has been for South Korea, and that's what I'll um, largely talk about today. Um, and that's because the disparity between Soviet goals, Chinese goals, and North Korean goals emerged earlier uh, than I think the disparity between American and South Korean goals did a serious disparity and was greater. And therefore, the lack of confidence in the alliance um, was more pronounced in the case of North Korea than in the case of the South. And it took a more extreme form. Um, also because the vulnerability of North Korea, one could argue, is greater and has been greater, at least certainly in the eyes of the North Koreans, it has been greater because it faces um, U.S. military power. Um, what I'll do is present uh, try a very quick kind of outline of a narrative that, that makes, I think, uh, the points that I just raised. Um, it will be drawing partly on documents that have been uncovered by uh, two of the researchers affiliated with this project, Balash Zalantai and Sergei Radchenko, drawing from Hungarian archives and Russian archives, neither of whom could be with us today. They're both um, far away. Uh, but their work has been published in a, a working paper that is available for you out, outside. Um, also, um, a bit by the work of James uh, Person, who is with us today, and I will um, refer briefly to his working paper that was just published, and I encourage all of you to pick up a copy of it. Um, beginning, though, with this question, we have to look at the years of the Korean War, because the legacy of the war is absolutely central in shaping the attitudes of North Korea. It could hardly be otherwise. Um, and with regard to the alliance dilemma, what we see as we look at the North Korean experience of the war um, on the basis of Russian archives is that um, North Korea had very good reason to develop a lack of self a lack of confidence in its Soviet ally and in its Chinese ally. This stems from what happened in October 1950 when U.S. forces advanced into North Korea following the Incheon landing in September. Um, the Soviets and the Chinese were obviously the people to rescue the situation. Uh, there had been an agreement among the three powers before the war began that if North Korea got into trouble, uh, the Chinese would be the ones to send troops. The Soviets would not send troops um, to confront the Americans. But when the time came in order to make good on that pro uh, promise, um, 
the Chinese hesitated. They hesitated for two weeks um, and then finally sent a message to uh, Moscow that they would not, in fact, be able to send troops um, to assist North Korea. When Joseph Stalin received that message from the Chinese, he then decided immediately, apparently without any hesitation, that he would not fill in the gap, right? He would not send Soviet troops to confront the Americans. He was not going to risk a war with the United States over the fate of North Korea. And so instead, he sent an order to Kim Il-sung to evacuate his remaining troops from Korean territory. So in other words, Kim was to give up um, his country entirely, evacuate into um, Soviet territory or Chinese territory. Now, the very next day, the Chinese changed their mind and sent a different message. And as we all know, they did, in fact, enter the war in, in, um, in a very big way. Um, but it's not difficult to imagine the impact on Kim's uh, way of thinking that the experience of this evacuation order had. Um, and then secondly, the war experience was that despite the might of the Soviet armed forces, which had just defeated Nazi Germany and contributed to defeating Japan, um, the Soviet Air Force, all right, as powerful as the American Air Force, um, was given the mis mission only to defend the bridges going into North Korea from China, the supply line, and the bases in China from which um, the, the relief effort into North Korea would be launched. Right? It did not have the mission to defend North Korean territory. Um, consequently, uh, North Korea was completely at the mercy of American bombing. Um, this bombing lasted for the entire war, uh, resulted in the destruction of nearly every building um, in the entire country, unimaginable destruction. The Soviet Air Force did eventually, once the war became a stalemate, um, make some attempts to, uh, to establish some air bases on North Korean territory from which they could challenge American bombers, but it was um, too late by that time. Um, they were never able to get their fields built because they would be bombed, you know, as soon as um, a preliminary structure was laid down. Um, and so it's not true that the Soviets never made any attempt. They did, but it was uh, certainly too little and too late. Um, the skill of the Soviet pilots was great. Uh, it's quite striking, if you think about it, that the Soviet pilots flying over the Yalu River were able to prevent American um, pilots from ever bombing those bridges. You know? Almost three years of attempts to bomb the bridges over the Yalu, and the Americans couldn't do it. Now, that's an impressive record on the part of the Soviet Air Force. So from the point of view of the North Korean leadership, this very impressive capability was there, but it was right on their border. Right? It was never brought over North Korean territory itself. So this, I would suggest, left a very profound legacy of uh, distrust, of lack of confidence, of an attitude that if North Korea was going to survive physically, it would have to do so itself. It would make use of whatever it could get from the Soviets, the Chinese, but ultimately it would have to only rely on its own resources. Now, Kim's political survival also um, was at issue very soon after the war in 1956. This is what James's excellent paper is about, which will eventually be his dissertation, and so we will eventually have a, a panel just with James presenting the whole story. But if I can summarize just very, very briefly, um, the change, of, the very dramatic change of course that Nikita Khrushchev launched in February of 1956 was a political threat to Kim Il-sung. Um, because Kim was following in Stalin's footsteps, of course, uh, doing things the Stalin way, and suddenly um, Khrushchev uh, changed the, the, the um, line for the entire 
communist camp. Um, the, the result of Khrushchev's change of policy was the empowerment of those within North Korea, those within the party and the government who were unhappy with Kim Il-sung's policies, with the, his personal cult, with his economic policies, with various other policies. So they were able to begin um, to think they could challenge Kim Il-sung, begin to attempt to do so, begin openly to criticize Kim, eventually um, to ask for assistance from the Soviets for challenging Kim Il-sung's policies. Um, they tried to do this in, in the summer of 56, in August 56 at a plenum. They failed politically, but when they, and, and the leaders were, were purged and fled to China, when that happened, the mm -hmm. Soviets and the Chinese um, both considered what was happening within the North Korean party as an international issue within the communist movement and therefore intervened, um, sent two very high level uh, emissaries to Pyongyang, uh, very bad choice from Kim Il-sung's point of view. Uh, one was Anastas Mikoyan, who had just overthrown the Stalinist uh, ruler of Hungary. This is not a very <laughs> auspicious sign from Kim's <laughs> point of view. Um, the second was Peng De Huai, who had been the commander, and oh my goodness, I mean, you know, what worse person could there possibly have been? Throughout uh, the Korean War, once the Chinese entered, Peng continuously humiliated Kim Il-sung, uh, taking over the leadership of the war and making it perfectly clear he had uh, very low regard for Kim's capabilities. He may have had good reason for doing that, but in any case, from Kim's point of view, you know, uh, Peng was, was the person who had humiliated him. So these two men come to Pyongyang in September of 56 um, at the instruction of these two massive giants, right, standing at North Korea's back, um, to instruct Kim Il-sung to make a public self-criticism. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Right. And to change his policy and to reinstate the leaders of the opposition movement that he had just purged. All right. A very serious political challenge to Kim. Now it's not clear that they were really intending to overthrow Kim and replace him, but this was certainly a very serious um, challenge to Kim's uh, rule as he defined it, as he wished it to be. And so very early in the history of North Korea, you know. 50, 53, the war years, then 56, just three years later. There were serious challenges to the physical survival of the country and the political survival of the leadership coming from the Allies. All right. So that's, that's the, sort of the background. Now, perhaps not surprisingly, given um, that experience, North Korea's efforts to acquire its own nuclear capability began very early. Um, we see in the documents that, um, that are available for you in the new working paper already uh, laying out in August 1962, all right, really quite early, August 1962, the logic of a need for um, nuclear capability laid out by uh, Pak Sung Chul, the, the foreign minister of the DPRK, speaking to the Soviet ambassador when the Soviet ambassador has talked to him about the Soviet effort um, to establish non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. This is, um, well, one cannot rule out, the, uh, the DPRK foreign minister speaking, one cannot rule out the possibility that the USA has already sold the secrets of the manufacture of nuclear weapons to the Federal Republic of Germany and then showed an initiative quote by calling for a treaty by which the Soviet Union would not be able to do the same thing with regard to other socialist countries. Second, who can impose such a treaty on countries that do not have nuclear weapons but are perhaps successfully working in that direction? Recently, Pak said, I think this spring, I read a small report by the Associated Press, so Pak is reading the AP, um, that expressed a supposition to the effect that the Chinese comrades, for instance, are successfully working in this direction. I do not know from which sources this information originated, but I think 
Why indeed wouldn't the Chinese comrades work on this? The Americans hold on to Taiwan, to South Korea and South Vietnam. They blackmail the people with their nuclear weapons. And with their help, they rule on these continents and do not intend to leave. Their possession of nuclear weapons and the lack thereof in our hands objectively helps them, therefore, to eternalize their rule. They have a large stockpile, and we're to be forbidden even to think about the manufacture of nuclear weapons? I think in such case the advantage will be on the American side. 1962, really very clear expression of the logic behind developing nuclear capability. Now, excuse me, Catherine. Yeah. I, I apologize for, for interrupting. I wanted to quickly give uh, Senator President Lee Hamilton, who <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, my opportunity to say a couple of words. I know his schedule is. Uh, uh, well, I think they'd uh, so. learn a lot more if they just kept listening to Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice to see you, Catherine. I am delighted I have a chance to drop by and uh, greet you. Uh, it's an honor for the Wilson Center to host uh, this event. Uh, it certainly is in accord with our purposes here at the Center. Uh, we pride ourselves at the Center on enhancing the public dialogue uh, and trying to shed light upon uh, some of the major public uh, policy issues of the day. And we are especially appreciative of the contribution that scholars can make to that uh, public policy process. Uh, North Korea, of course, is very much in our newspapers day after day and the policy questions are very difficult and very grave for us. Uh, you will be presenting, I'm sure, already have presented this morning and again this afternoon, new information, new perspectives, uh, new historical context about uh, our relationship with the Koreas and particularly North Korea. Uh, so we wish you well in that discussion. Thank you for coming here. Uh, we're delighted to have you. Uh, I am enormously pleased with the uh, leadership of Christian Osterman, who heads up our history and public policy program. Uh, he gives us outstanding leadership here, and we have been pleased to work with the Korea Foundation. We're very grateful for their support for, for this program. I want to say a word, too, about the uh, partnership with the Graduate School for North Korean Studies in Seoul and the work that Ambassador Soon has done to work with us. So uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I apologize for coming late and departing early, but I don't think I could add very much to your discussion, to be very frank about it. Uh, we're delighted to have you here. It's uh, in keeping, certainly in keeping, with the uh, purposes of this institution. I wish you a very successful time. Catherine, I apologize for uh, interrupting you. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Lee Hamilton for your uh, dropping in. We are very much honored to have you here even briefly and uh, we appreciate your kind remarks. Yeah, yeah, we you. will continue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, in the fall of 1963, so a year after the statement that I just uh, read, we see another statement regarding nuclear weapons, this time a kind of urgent, re, you know, um, requ well, inquiry into the possibility of North Korea acquiring them um, themselves. Um, this is a, the Soviet ambassador reporting from a conversation he had with Soviet specialists who came to North Korea uh, to work on uranium mining. Um, they're reporting that one of the Koreans they met with um, asked, in the opinion of our specialists, meaning the Soviet specialists, can the Koreans create an atomic bomb? Upon hearing the reply to the effect that the economy of the DPRK can't cope with the creation of nuclear weapons, the Koreans said it would cost much less than in the DPRK than in other countries. If we tell our workers that we're taking up such a task, they'll agree to work free of charge for several years. <laughs> so this is the beginning of a kind of urgent effort on the part of North Koreans uh, to get their own nuclear capability. Now, this was 
uh, frustrated constantly by the Soviets um, who were not willing to give North Koreans nuclear capability. They, e even for peaceful uses, uh, they gave it even to Yugoslavia, right? <laughs> Um, the outcast in the camp um, before giving it to North Koreans, which um, made Pyongyang quite resentful. In this context of the early 60s, I think we have to also mention the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, because seen from the point of view of a small communist country that directly faced American military power, the story of the Cuban Missile Crisis was that the Soviets sold out Cuba. Right. They pulled back their uh, nuclear weapons from Cuba under American pressure and left the Cubans in the lurch um, without, without consult consulting with them about this. Um, so I think the lesson of the Cuban Missile Crisis was also important for North Korea. Now, as the 60s wore on, um, the Soviets increasingly tried uh, to, uh, to pull the Koreans back from aspirations to military adventurism. The Soviets by this time were much more cautious in their dealings with the Americans. Um, we have, for example, a record of Brezhnev, uh, the leader of the Soviet Union, receiving um, a high North Korean official in Moscow raising several questions, one of them being the tension between North and South Korea along the demilitarized zone. Brezhnev says basically the Soviet Union does not accept the position of the DPRK with regard to the cause of the tension along the DMZ. It thinks that the United States does not intend to increase tension in this region and that nothing points to the conclusion that the U.S. really aims at starting a new Korean War. It's obvious that the various factors of the international situation of the USA, such as the Vietnam War, do not make the prospect of a new Asian war attractive to the United States. The Soviet Union has concluded that the majority of the incidents occurring along the DMZ are initiated by the DPRK. <laughs> the Soviets on their part expound to their Korean comrades that they understand the necessity of the DPRK's struggle for the reunification of the country. They support this struggle, but they are of the opinion that one should pay a due regard to the concrete Korean and international conditions of the actual period when choosing the means and methods of the struggle. Therefore, the Soviet side doubts that armed struggle is an appropriate method for the restoration of the unity of Korea. Okay. <laughs> All right, so a disparity then uh, between Soviet perceptions, Soviet goals, and North Korean. In the early 70s, North Korea refused to join the NPT, despite Soviet efforts to persuade it to do so. Uh, there's a very interesting document uh, showing the Soviets trying desperately to persuade the uh, North Korean leadership of the wisdom of nuclear nonproliferation by citing the hypothetical example of Japan acquiring nuclear weapons. So the Soviet comrades emphasized that on the part of the Soviet Union as well as other socialist countries that hold correct views, patient and persistent persuasion was needed to get the Korean position closer to our common position on the big issues of international politics. The task was not an easy one. They cited the Soviet-Korean debate over nuclear nonproliferation as an example. The Soviet side asked the Korean comrades whether they thought it would be a good thing if, for instance, Japan, which possesses the required industrial and technical cap capacity, obtained nuclear weapons. In this concrete case, the Korean comrades naturally acknowledged that nuclear nonproliferation was justified, but in general, they did not. <laughs> so it didn't actually work. Uh, a game effort, however, on the part of the Soviets to try to, to persuade North Korea to uh, embrace nonproliferation. Now, jumping ahead rather uh, quickly to the late 80s, we see uh, a really kind of quite dramatic uh, twist in this issue. Um, by that time, North Korea understood that it did not have the economic means to challenge South Korea, that a military solution was impossible, um, partly because of the deterrent power of American nuclear weapons. 
And consequently, they supported Gorbachev's very radical initiatives for uh, denuclearization that he was pursuing with President Reagan. Um, so for a, a period of time, soon after Gorbachev um, took office, there did seem to be a kind of coming together of Soviet perceptions and North Korean perceptions regarding nuclear weapons, uh, regarding um, the issue of military conflict on the Korean Peninsula. However, uh, this was cut short by Soviet recognition of South Korea right, and all of the other aspects of Gorbachev's uh, new course. And then uh, it was quite decisively ended in 1989 and 1991 with the collapse first of the Soviet Empire in Eastern Europe and then of the Soviet Union itself. So after 1991, North Korea was left with a truly self-reliant security posture. <laughs> um, de facto, <laughs> quite unwanted. Uh, so it had the actual experience of what North Korea feared that we were talking about earlier today, of a, of a disengagement or, uh, of the Americans or a withdrawal of American forces. This is a, well, actually experienced by North Korea. Um, the one response to that, as we all know, has been a renewed effort um, uh, to develop its own nuclear capability. Um, I would close just with the observation that I think if we survey this history, uh, we can conclude that the question of trust uh, is a serious question in trying to persuade North Korea to embrace a new approach uh, to its security. Uh, if we attempt to create some kind of multilateral security structure for Northeast Asia that we might be able to tempt North Korea to become a part of, to gradually resolve the military uh, tensions on the Korean Peninsula as well as, as well as elsewhere in the region, we will be confronting um, learned, you know, uh, deeply conditioned attitudes on the part of the North Korean leadership um, that have as their basis actual experience and a long period of, of development. Uh, so I think it would be useful as we look at coming up with a creative solution today in very different international circumstances to be aware of the roots of uh, the profound mistrust on the part of North Korea. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Now I, I, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Robert Wempler, our uh, discussant. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ambassador. Uh, First, I'd like to thank Catherine and Christian for inviting me to come to this and take part. It's been fascinating so far, and I found usually I don't know what I think until I have to write it down anyway, so this helps me to get my thoughts together. Um, overall, just observations first on the papers, uh, both obviously are very welcome to people working in this field and very important for the contributions they make regarding the new information that's coming out of the archival resources in the former Warsaw Pact nations and in Russia uh, concerning these issues that we're talking about today. Speaking selfishly, uh, they provide me with some great ammunition to use in my project in the National Security Archive where I'm working to secure a declassification of U.S. documents relating to the two Koreas uh, since roughly the 1960s, the uh, Nixon era. The availability, uh, for example, of uh, records of the meetings between uh, Pak and Nixon uh, can provide me with information I can use to go to the State Department and say, well, look, South Korea sees no problem in releasing these, why can't you? Uh, the same thing can be said for the documentation coming out regarding the North Korean nuclear program. Um, as I will discuss a little bit later, there's a real paucity of information uh, relating to CIA and other intelligence assessments on this, uh, and uh, again, we can use this to say, here's information in the public record, to what degree can this help you? rethink some of your decisions about this. Both of the papers uh, take a very tight and necess uh, necessary tight focus on their topics so they can focus on the new information coming out. 
What I hope to do is try to widen this focus somewhat. Uh, this also has the added virtue of letting me talk about some things where I really can at least sound somewhat informed and try to put the studies into a broader context thematically and also somewhat chronologically. Um, I'd like to start with the papers on the nuclear uh, program in North Korea. As I said, there's a real lack of documentation available in the U.S. on um, just how the intelligence agencies were assessing the North Korean program and particularly uh, based on what I looked at a couple of years ago when I first started looking at this, uh, the record starts somewhere in the 1980s under Reagan. So we've got this entire history here which either the CIA didn't pick up on or they haven't declassified. Uh, and so what we're getting here is just in essence a whole course of history about the prologue to the more recent uh, developments that people just were not aware of and this is very useful for a number of reasons that are obvious. Looking at some of the questions the paper raised for me, and some of these actually Catherine started going into in her talk, which I found very useful, even though it preempted me somewhat, uh, is uh, trying to find out what does this tell us about the North Korean motivation to develop a nuclear weapons program. I mean, going through the papers and the documentation, you get the usual and expected range of possible motivations, uh, you know, political influence and symbolism, uh, a desire for a real military capability driven by a sense of threat and vulnerability, uh, or the feeling that vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Warsaw Pact allies, North Korea is not being treated uh, well. Uh, I sort of call this the mom always liked you best syndrome. Um, I sort of went through some of the um, like international relations literature on this in connection with reading a chapter in a book that Ethel Solingen is doing out in California on how nations make decisions whether or not to pursue nuclear weapons programs. And most of you are probably aware of the contending viewpoints of realists, near-realists versus uh, neoliberal frameworks for trying to understand the weighing of options and why people do this and why they don't. And I'm sort of wondering to what degree this sorts of real historical data can serve to put a little bit more nuance into these rather more rigid or abstract sort of uh, presentations of the way in which these decisions are made. Um, one of the things I'm sort of wondering in looking at this is, you know, uh, do you view the Pyongyang leadership as rational actors, uh, you know, like a realist approach, uh, or are they acting within certain constraints established by historical uh, experience, culture, uh, the framework created by the alliance with the Soviet Union? Uh, you know, how do you weigh those sorts of influences upon what they're doing, what they see as their options, and what they're being driven to do? Uh, do we need to frame rationality within a context, uh, as I said, of historical, cultural, and other experiences? And Catherine clearly is pointing us in that direction in terms of giving this prologue to understanding the way in which Kim was viewing his relationship with his Soviet patrons. And again, given the range of understandable and expected motivations that come out of the different uh, uh, discussions with the North Koreans reported upon these documents, you know, how would you prioritize them? You know, I'm sure they sort of differ depending on which side of the bed Kim woke up on one morning, but still there's got to be a basket here and how does he sort of view these in terms of what his bottom line is, you know? Is he do, using this as leverage for other things he wants or is he really trying to get these? Is this something you're trying to develop in order to bargain away later for something else you really want? I mean, you know, what is the strategy here? You know, what is this context that he's sort of following and trying to do this? The other thing that's sort of clear and uh, someone earlier this morning was talking about how they felt sorry for South Korea at this time. Uh, I don't feel sorry for North Korea, but it's really clear it seems nobody really liked or trusted them. Um, so it's very useful to put this whole framework within uh, the larger context of the viewpoints and goals of the other major powers who they were dealing with. They were like setting constraints upon what they can do and try to figure out again where this mistrust came on the other side in terms of saying, okay, we don't want to let them do this and why. Uh, finally, I guess uh, the documents may perhaps provide another reason to miss the good old days of the Cold War when there was a degree of constraint that possibly could be imposed on Pyongyang by Moscow uh, as opposed to today where uh, North Korea's options for obtaining such technology seems to be a little bit wider and less uh, open to uh, any sort of, I guess, control or influence uh, witness what's happened with the talks going on for now close to four years. Um, turning to the paper on South Korean security policy, um, 
Some of this is going to come down to sort of like a review of Cold War 101, but I want to place this in the context of the overall Nixon-Kissinger diplomacy. I mean, this is not going on in a vacuum, but again, there's the detente diplomacy with Moscow and Beijing and the major priorities that they're pursuing in terms of what their interests and goals are. And you look at this, you know, you have to look at this framework in order to try to understand some of what's going on with the interactions between U.S. and Seoul on this issue of the U.S. force commitment and presence in South Korea and the ongoing degree and level of the U.S. security commitment and military assistance to Seoul. There was a long-standing U.S. interest in trying to scale back the force presence in Korea. Uh, Bill Stuke recently has given a very good paper on this going all the way back, you know, to the Eisenhower period coming up through the whole Carter imbroglio and after to show, so like, that's a theme there. Um, it was never seen as a commitment in perpetuity for eternity. Um, you can put this in the context, as the Professor Moss paper does, of the Nixon Doctrine and what can be seen as the early stages of the subsequent U.S. emphasis on burden sharing with its allies. Uh, it's an illustrative of the U.S. concept, as I see it, of the political economy of alliance strategy, wherein the U.S. has a proper role to play, reflecting its strengths and its interests, while the allies have their proper role to play in terms of primarily ground defense and national defense. To me, it's interesting that what Nixon is saying has real clear echoes of what Eisenhower was saying back in the 1950s, again, about proper U.S. roles and roles of the allies in this connection relating to NATO. And for Eisenhower, the idea was the U.S. provided the major deterrent, nuclear, within which the Allies were supposed to develop their own forces to deal with special, uh, more localized threats, and they work together, each uh, giving according to their best abilities. And therefore, that's the way it should fire out, and the U.S. should not be providing ground forces, military assistance, and the nuclear deterrent. Now, this all plays into the concept of just sort of like real changes that are going on in U.S. policy, and I've been having a bit of deja vu in this conference because 10 years ago I put together a conference with the Asia program on the Nixon shocks, and I was wondering whether there was a Korean equivalent to Nixon shaku, uh, but there seems to be, you know, you know, there are things going on here reflecting the U.S. effort under Nixon and under Kissinger to try to reassess and rethink the U.S. role, U.S. commitments, and U.S. burdens, and this is tied in not just to the military, but to what happens with Bretton Woods. Uh, there's a whole sort of like rethinking of how the U.S. can carry out its role in a way which is not going to be so overly demanding of U.S. resources over time. Now, the internal discussions within the Nixon administration from you know the time they come in, they're looking at uh, Korea, trying to see what's going to happen to the U.S. force commitments, what's going to happen in terms of military aid. And as you can see in some of the documents, uh, there's a very early sign given from Nixon that Kissinger takes as his mandate. He wants to start reducing the U.S. forces in Korea, and that is sort of what is laid down as the long-term goal, start scaling back that commitment. But there were some political and strategic considerations in place that would sort of have to serve to pace this withdrawal. And to me, these become clear, and this sort of balances the emphasis in Catherine's talk on the Soviet viewpoint and Kissinger's discussions with the Chinese over the same period. Um, I looked at some of these uh, records from 71 up through 74, uh, particularly his, uh, Kissinger's talks with Cho and Lai. And you see a really interesting development in the dialogue. It begins with the expected expression of expected positions on South Korea and North Korea and support for the Allies. But you also see developing sort of a search for a common ground in trying to do deal with this potentially destabilizing situation on the Korean Peninsula. Despite Kissinger's assurances in Tupac uh, when he met the South Korean leader uh, at the Blue House in November 1973 that he would never talk to Beijing about Korea without discussing it with South Korea first, Korea was almost always on the agenda from 1971 forward and trying to figure out how to deal with this situation. Some key points that come out of this. From 1971 forward, Kissinger is telling the Chinese that the U.S. had a long-term goal of reducing its force commitments to South Korea, with the hopes perhaps someday of even a total withdrawal. But he and Cho and Lai agreed this had to be done in a way that did not provide an opening for Japan to move in militarily to take the U.S. place in South Korean defense. 
this was something the Chinese consistently were harping on. We don't want to see the U.S. scale back, even though the Chinese want to see the U.S. scale back, but in so doing provide some sort of opening for Japan to move in because if there's anything the Chinese need to be worried about a great deal, it is the Japanese and the resurgence of Japanese militarism. Now, another sub-theme of the discussions between Kissinger and the Chinese is getting them to see the U.S.-Japanese relationship as a potentially very useful reign upon any Japanese adventurism in the future. Now, <clears throat> in terms of the uh, level of U.S. assistance to Korea, another theme that comes out of this is they're trying to find some way to sort of turn down the volume. Kissinger and the Chinese are, it seems to be, on the peninsula. I mean, you've had these repeated episodes of, you know, trying to get the Korea issue on the agenda of the U.N. and the standard back and forth, the positions which reduced anything. And it seems from looking at these discussions, there was like uh, cooperation on them to get that off of the agenda for a few years, to try to let's not have that sort of point there that could just inflame things for a while because it was not seen as useful. Um, as another part of this, at one point Kissinger's telling the Chinese that, you know, maybe the U.S. and the Chinese should think about maybe tacitly setting some limits on how much they're willing to provide military support and modernization to the North and the South so that each side will not have the capability to engage in any sort of adventuresome activities once they have these weapons in hand. So you have Kissinger talking about potential breaks upon U.S. assistance to South Korea in tandem with what the Chinese and hopefully the Russians would do to try to minimize the ability by mischief by their respective allies. Um, Catherine talked about trying to get the North Koreans to see a new way of pursuing their security interests. It seems Kissinger was trying to do this as well. I mean, one thing that comes out in these talks from 71, it seems to peak in 73 and then fall apart, was a rather complicated interlocking set of talks on let's end the UN command in Korea in connection with, with which Seoul and Moscow and Beijing would start talking, while the U.S. would start talking to Pyongyang, and Pyongyang would start talking to each other, and hopefully out of all of this you could start moving towards some ongoing parallel dialogue, which ended up with reduced uh, tensions on the peninsula, and more in the way of a move towards normalized relations. This seemed to be something that was taken very seriously by Kissinger and by the Chinese, um, but it sort of dis came to a real point in 73, which I'll discuss in a moment, and then it seemed to die off, and the only thing I can see from looking at the record is that there's a real sort of frosting of relations with Moscow after the 73 Mideast War, there seems to be a real sort of chilling of relations with the Chinese, plus there's some obstacles that get obtained with uh, dealing with Pyongyang, and then Seoul, as I will discuss in a moment, seemed to want to race ahead of the U.S., which got Kissinger kind of upset. Um, in trying to understand what the U.S. wants, and looking at Kissinger as a spokesman for this, there are obvious problems. I mean, I don't want to take him as the sole spokesman for U.S. policy, but still there's a very <coughs> substantial record there of what's being said at very high levels to the people who are very closely involved with making decisions about this. And there's an old maxim of bureaucrat bureaucratic politics that where you stand depends on where you sit. But with Kissinger, sometimes it seems that where he stands depends on who he's sitting with. Um, <laughs> Uh, now, I mean, uh, and if you, if, you know, if you look at him talking to uh, Pac, you look at him talking to the Russians, you look at him talking to the Chinese, you look at him talking to his own staff, you get different aspects of this, and to use an old term from Clinton years, you triangulate and try to figure out where things really are. Um, just to give you a sense of his assessment of the situation on the peninsula, and I almost feel I should have Byrne read this, and you'll get the the German gravitas, but I'll do my best here. Um, he meets with uh, Pock and Blue House in November of 1973. Uh, there's a lot of things going on at this point, of course. You know, you've had the Kim Dae-jung uh, <coughs> kidnapping. You just, you know, you got the, cold, the Middle East War sort of still trying to get it worked out. This is Kissinger's first meeting, so they're sort of filling each other out. And of course, a lot of things they're discussing is what's going on in uh, the peninsula. And so Kissinger sort of unloads himself here. And uh, he says, quite candidly, though I can't prove this, the Chinese are not eager to have any powerful unified countries on their borders. So I do not believe the unification of Korea has the same priority for the Chinese that it has for Pyongyang or for you. I think the, straight, I think the Chinese strangely do not mind the U.S. presence in Korea, particularly if they think that Japanese influence would rise if ours declined. 
I think the Chinese would be violently opposed to any military aggression by North Korea at this point because they would be afraid if we become involved with North Korea, we would isolate them from Pyongyang because the Soviet Union would support North Korea. Try to keep up. Also, if China supported North Korea in a military confrontation, that would drive Japan away from China. If the North Koreans attack and the Japanese support the South Koreans, then the Chinese would become more and more isolated. I personally think that the greater likelihood in terms of outside support for an attack by North Korea would come from the Soviets rather from the Chinese, but this could change in five years or so. So for what it's worth, that's how Kissinger saw the power politics playing out. It seems like everybody's afraid somebody else is going to do something. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, for, and for him, keeping things stable and not letting either the North or the South do anything to upset this seems to be one of his priorities and seems to be part of the agenda that develops in his talks with the Chinese. Now, um, the Korean Peninsula was a real concern for Kissinger and for Nixon and the U.S., you know, they didn't want to see a war break out there. They'd already had a major war, you know, or a police action, if you want to call it that, in the 1950s. And they realized that if it, something broke out there, it could create major problems. It was also a very useful piece in the agenda of his discussions where he could see common ground with Beijing and possibly Moscow and trying to reduce the potential hostilities there without in any way betraying the U.S. commitment to Seoul. He was open to discussion, but echoing his and Nixon's displeasure when Tokyo seemed ready to race ahead of the U.S. and seeking normalization of relations with Beijing, Kissinger was also concerned to make sure that Seoul did not get ahead of the game in pursuing contact with Pyongyang. A uh, piece of evidence about this, in mid-1973, this rather convoluted package of t discussions seemed to be coming to perhaps a culmination, but then it seemed that Seoul suddenly wanted to move ahead and take the initiative on this and do something publicly, in large part because they thought Pyongyang was going to steal the initiative and take the credit. This leads to a rather spirited discussion within uh, Kissinger's inner circle in which Kissinger makes it clear that, you know, I have other things on my mind besides South Korea and North Korea. I have bigger fish to fry and I can't believe that Philip Habib has to know what we're going to say to them tomorrow or South Korean relations are going to fall apart. In essence, he wanted to pull in the reins and it's interesting that within three days, he made a formal proposal to the Chinese representative of the UN laying out this whole package deal. He wanted to make sure he was in the lead and not Pyongyang. Uh, as I said, this seemed to just all of a sudden just dissipate, and I got a feeling part of it was what was happening in the last half of 73 and other uh, things that were going on in terms of the U.S.-Soviet and the U.S.-Chinese uh, relations. And it seems that by you move into this post period in 1974, it seems that uh, Kissinger is realizing there are some limits to what can be achieved in these superpower negotiations and a realization that perhaps there is a need to take the consideration of the other allies in mind. And I guess the proof of that, I could just point to one key decision that was made in January of 74 when Secretary of State Kissinger got together with his staff to go through a large body of issues relating to Korea. And one key decision was that any U.S. movement in regard to relations with North Korea should be first discussed with the ROK government and that the pace of U.S. movement in relation with North Korea be kept in balance with Soviet and PRC movement towards relations with the ROK. So he seemed somewhat chastened, and by this point, it seems he was seeing the value of talking to the South Koreans. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Now I would like to invite Dr. Oh, Hong Dan. Well, I, I told uh, Bob to speak as much as he likes, and I think I have only one minute left, <laughs> 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 which is good news because I, mine will be very succinct. Anyway, I follow the everybody, you know, in Korean world that uh, in the summertime, watermelon bender buy my melon, and the lazy melon bender follows him, Dito, means I also joined others that I'm very honored to be part of this interesting meeting. By the way, my compliments to two speakers. They're not only the papers, but the, their presentation was fabulous, which is usually the contrary in many conferences. First of all, I found Catherine, when, if she retired, she could be a book on the tape person. Very beautiful, round voice and uh, great, <laughs> great storytelling. I almost like uh, she could continue about two days. I could listen. And uh, the young Professor Ma is a kind of a newly found gem, and uh, he remembered that I gave a lecture at his university. So I didn't f recognize him, and I'm 
apologize. And uh, he has an incredible presentation, much richer than actually already good paper. Here is my point. When you go to the meeting the, talking about history, not the future, uh, maybe the, you have a couple of uh, kind of like uh, objectives, what to do or what to learn. First one is that basically clarify doubts and questions you have all along. Why the damn North Koreans found this way or why the bug reacted that way. And I think that uh, that's the first goal, and I think my first goal was met. And second goal is that um, since we are talking about mostly dead people, there is no political agenda <laughs> or politicization or overly criticizing it. We tend to be very gentle and try to be finding truth from facts because without politics we can talk about real facts and uh, data. And uh, I think the, again for that sense that um, I was very satisfied. And third thing is maybe very important because we are on the segue today talking about past connecting to the future because a week from today uh, Korea's current present will arrive to talk about the, all this military and alliance issue. So for that matter, the third objective is that the finding the deeper roots of the national strategic behavior, cultural characteristics, and behavioral pattern of the leaders so we can maybe the, distill all those wisdom and knowledge and apply to today's crisis or issues so we can wisely resolve instead of going into the, another repeat of the history. Uh, for that one, I have a little bit of doubts whether we could work a little bit harder. So based on those uh, three, uh, the kind of my quest, uh, I, first of all, let me talk about the Mr. Professor Ma's paper. It's an excellent good coverage for these papers, for these years, and I really learned quite a lot. Very enjoyable reading it. And also it's a very balanced analysis with a credible source and um, open also interprets uh, very scholarly and very balanced views without tilting toward one side of it. So for us to looking into the past and maybe using some of these newly found and analyzed facts to wisely use for the future. Uh, but that's the best comment I can give to you. And now the however se session means that uh, since he's a still young scholar, and I'm sure that he will accept my suggestion without any negative attitude. First one is that uh, uh, there, are, there are maybe lessons for later South Korean leaders. And I think that has maybe, maybe he plans to do it maybe someday in his book, but uh, definitely we could, we could draw lessons for the later South Korean leaders. Even maybe current one is too late, but maybe the future one. <laughs> and uh, also, the, the, this is a past very important phase of the Korean, uh, Korean search or Korean saga, looking for the more self-defense and you know, bitter confrontation against North Korea, as well as a small goat um, surrounded by the large size whales or whatever. But uh, what about the long-term consequences of a one historic era maybe went through that phase? Uh, did it leave any long-term consequences psychologically or national strategic behavior or maybe even in the trust level of the toward the un United States? He mentioned there's a concluding remarks about credibility issue. And so I think if he maybe dwell upon on this very critical question, it will be a fabulous paper. And lastly, although there are some mentioning about Vietnam, definitely, which is an important factor, but uh, I think we need a lot more historical context, looking into the maybe the, uh, the regional context, uh, regional environment, and then also the overall in the, in the global history, where is the Cold War is standing, and uh, where is the place, little place of Korea. I think if you have that kind of a much more broader horizon, I think it will be an excellent paper to be published without having any doubt for the first quality journal. Now, to these two very uh, mysterious gentlemen's paper, which was summarized by the Catherine, and I, I enjoyed the Catherine's first part of analysis very much, but uh, my job was reading the, these two documents and then come back with some comments. Uh, well, let me offer, first of all, it's a uh, very nice and rich material, and uh, kind of um, I discovered a lot of facts and uh, new, very interesting details. It is great reading in the, right before you go to bed because you don't have to worry about politics, but basically you read what happened in the past, but still you can learn uh, quite great stuff. 
and uh, also the episodes to describe the vividly about the dialogue between the North Korean representative and the Soviet Union government and very atmospherically how the how the details of negotiation went through it was a great part of it that's a good part of these two papers and the second good part is that uh, it kind of brings out the crystal clearly about the very strongly and clearly about uh, what kind of uh, leadership and regime the North Korea was in a sense in terms of their mentality their strategic behavior and their, their, their negotiation style and uh, their vulnerability and their psychological problems and all these things is constantly coming out, particularly in dealing with the nuclear, nuclear question. So in a sense, it was great revelation about, uh, uh, to us today, who, who is dealing with a lot of difficult questions about the, what's the past or the future in terms of North Korean proliferation, is that North Korea then was already a very tough person, tough country to deal with. And also it was a difficult country for even for their best allies, which is Soviet Union and China, which in a sense we can again distill that behavioral pattern to use for analyzing today's resolution, which was Catherine's last observation. But uh, having said that these two positive uh, comments, my, the, the sort of a kind of a question is that neither document mentions actually the Soviet offer of the light water reactors to North Korea. In a sense, why this important part is missing. And second missing part is that as if these two scholars almost wrote in isolation of the most literature on North Korea. Maybe they are not the North Korean experts, but somehow kind of like a really basic important literature on North Korea is missing, including the North Korean nuclear literature. Victor Cha and Michael Majar and some of the very basics, he, they used it, but in a sense very important, a lot of fact-based solid nuclear material and nuclearization process written by the great professionals are totally missing. So in that sense, I think, um, I have to ask later further, maybe at the reception time, to Catherine about their background and the, where, where they're standing. These are the, my comments. Finally, I would like to add one thing. As I mentioned, that we are really uh, entering the very critical time now. That uh, yesterday I presented my presentation at the American University. My title was the, the Rising and Fallen American Alliances in East Asia. And one is definitely, you can say, which one is which. Uh, I had a bit, bitter, sweet uh, time that uh, describing good things about with Japan, although with a lot of uh, shade behind it, but the fallen alliance, which is a tough question today. I am the co-director of the policy research group for the vision of the 21st century alliance between the, North Cor uh, between the South Korea and the U.S., of which the studies uh, just uh, wrapped up. And uh, if I tell you one episode, when we started two years ago, I, I chose seven scholars. Uh, to work with me and then government, all the desk directors and everybody are basically observants and we have a senior advisory body. And we started with some kind of like a little bit of a hopeful, optimistic tone such as Koreans are really, it's greatly improved the economy and they can do much better but at the same time alliance can be strengthened and we can talk about the new Korea's role for the changed uh, atmosphere in, in East Asia such as strategic flexibility and all these things, but suddenly after that downhill because of all these interesting new ideas surfaced in from the Korean theater. And today I think uh, most of my members who started with a great vision and led to the great job ended up to be saying that maybe it's time to leave Korea. And as a Korean-American uh, the analyst, I, 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 I felt that my job is that present come and go, but alliance once you break it, it's very hard to put it back. And in a sense, maybe the cost-benefit analysis, maybe Korea's loss uh, hidden or, or surfaced is maybe larger than Korea's gain. So I think this is a critical time. And in that sense, I thank you to Catherine for organizing this meeting. That's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Oh. Uh, Professor Ma, now you are to respond to the questions raised by the discussant. Uh, thank you very much for very uh, kind and also very useful comment. I think both of the commentators uh, pointed out that my uh, paper was is rather narrowly focused. I do admit that, and I actually prepared uh, my defense for it. Uh, <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Uh, Self-reliant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Well, I, I do agree that I need a uh, more, uh, uh, somewhat broader uh, well, context to be uh, well reflected in the paper. And for example, I am very much interested in the what was the uh, global and uh, superpower detente actually affected the uh, lesser powers in Northeast Asia and how those detente was related to the uh, dialogues between the two Koreas that initiated that started uh, from 1971 and forward and, and, and forward and also I'm I'm already uh, written a paper in unfortunately in Korean about the, the consequences of those international politics and the uh, the relationship between North and South Koreas on the domestic politics, especially the uh, of, uh, increasing authoritarianism in both Koreas. And I, I do agree that those well, internet, well, global and regional and well, inter-Korean and, and also the domestic factors are all interconnected uh, to be analyzed in a well, very complicated fashion. And my defense uh, of uh, somewhat narrow focus of this paper uh, is that the I wanted to uh, give more light, shed more light on the usefulness of the uh, Korean documents first, Korean well, sources, well, which is in the kept in the archives of the uh, uh, the foreign ministry. And secondly, uh, I wanted to strike out the well, strategic uh, response uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the part of the uh, Park Jong-hee government, which was uh, a better, I, I think it must be uh, appreciated that the uh, Park Jong-hee government was more shrewd, I believe, in terms of reading the American uh, strategy uh, towards Northeast Asia. And they were kind of a uh, uh, well, very sophisticated sense of how to react to the, the changes of the American foreign policy. Regarding the Dr. O's comments, uh, what should be the lessons for uh, future uh, South Korean leaders, uh, which we can draw from this episode or the, the history, well, it's a really important uh, well, question, and I think it's quite hard to thought about that by myself. I think that the, there are even, or well, having said that, I about having said about the uh, shrewdness, more shrewdness of the uh, Park Jong Hee government's response to American foreign policy change. I think still there were some kind of limitations of. Uh, well, what my what I might call bargaining approach, uh, because uh, Park Jong Hee tried to get as much as possible from the American side, and well, that I think was quite uh, un inevitable in a sense. But at the same time, those kind of hard bargaining sometimes uh, caused uh, lessening uh, U.S. confidence in. Uh, in its uh, junior partner, allied partner in, in the Korean Peninsula. And therefore, uh, well, having uh, this kind of ep or historical episode in hand, I believe uh, we might have to ask what, what is to be uh, the being the allies. And I think, well, well because of We've already find, as I just mentioned, that there are, if there are certain limits, limitations of uh, bargaining approach that uh, the Park Jong Hee government had uh, achieved, well, had took, uh, probably the South Koreans may have to think more carefully uh, about the shared value and uh, mutual confidence between the allies uh, to maintain the alliance relationship between the two countries. Uh, and thank you very much for Dr. Wempler about well, his uh, giving us a very interesting um, pictures and dynamics in the uh, 
period of well, it dynamics of international politics in uh, in in 1972 to 1974 to five, I I recently uh, examined the uh, well PhD uh, dissertation uh, submit to to the Seoul National University. Uh, well, actually, I found that dissertation very interesting because well, the main thesis uh, were p uh, placed on and that thesis was that the uh, North was well, uh, the Nixon administration and the Ford administration uh, during in the process of uh, its uh, negotiation, well, a talk with uh, China and other uh, regional powers. Uh, Americans uh, did found, especially the, the, the Dr. Kissinger, uh, found the uh, the f utility of uh, U.S. Uh, military presence in in Northeast Asia, especially in Korea. And therefore, uh, Dr. Kissinger, uh, well, on, on that, uh, in that regard, Dr. Kissinger was in kind of a bureaucratic uh, struggle with uh, uh, the, the Defense Department uh, and uh, its chief, uh, Melvin Laird, who uh, literally wanted to apply Nixon doctrine to its policy towards uh, Northeast Asia. And, and that the dissertation that, that I just mentioned uh, argued that the, uh, it was a sort of foundation of stabilizing role that the U.S. forces could do uh, in uh, Northeast Asian region. And I'm, of course, uh, I, I could not actually uh, covered all the documents uh, available in the Korean uh, Foreign Ministry. I've ended uh, my uh, research uh, up to the year 1972. I'm, o I'm also looking forward to the contribution that Dr. Wempler would uh, make. And I'm, I'm also trying to, I'll, I'll be also trying to found, find more uh, interesting documents in uh, nine in years uh, after 1972. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Weatherspeed. It's your turn to. Um, Just very briefly, um, Bob's question about um, prioritizing the different goal, uh, the different you know purposes of nuclear weapons. Um, it, it, it seems to me, just from reading the record we have so far, that um, guaranteeing physical survival was, you know, by far and away, um, the most important purpose of you know, getting such weapons. Um, but that was primarily in the early years. It does seem that later, e even under Kim Il-sung, um, there was an awareness of other, you know, approaches to. Um, to accomplishing that goal. And then uh, certainly under Kim Jong-il, I, I don't have any documents for the Kim Jong-il years, but um, there, from what I do know from um, other people who have inside information, um, there does appear to be some um, interest on the part of, or, or, ha or wa was at least at a period of, certain period of time, interest in using um, such weapons as bargaining chips. So I think it, it it ha the process has evolved over time um, for the North Korean leadership. Um, but, but still, if uh, those weapons are going to be bargained away, then they're going to have to be bargained away for some kind of security that can you know, be relied on. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we have around 25 minutes for interactions. and. Um, uh, the floor is open for any questions and comments. And yes, Dr. Schaefer. Yeah, thank you very much, both for this. Does it work? Yeah. For this presentation. <laughs> uh, let me try to add two things on North Korea and just check whether you think, Catherine, it might have hold some value. With regard to the military umbrella of the Soviet Union, I think in the 60s up to 86, maybe before Gorbachev came, 
North Korea could really somehow rely actually on the North on the Soviet military umbrella and in 68 and 69 and maybe Bob Wampler can talk about that I think in those two crises with Pueblo and with the EC-121 the Soviet indications to the American side that U.S. retaliation against North Korea might be considered something grave which the Soviet Union will not let unanswered really twice basically saved the neck of Kim Il-sung who did this unprovoked, who actually did not inform the Soviets, who just took their assistance for granted, but actually he could take it for granted, I think. And the Soviet Union really gave them military umbrella and also officially political cover. We now know from all the documents there have been a lot of internal misgivings and really the Soviets were upset many occasions over the North Koreans, but in public they always gave them political cover and a military umbrella. Um, and with regard to North Korean self-reliance security, of course, if you compare it with South Korea, uh, North Korea was comparatively self-reliant in security terms because it did not need foreign troops on its soil uh, after 58, after the Chinese troops left. And if you just compare it, and I think this was one of the point of reference for the North Koreans, if you compare it also with the Soviet Empire in Europe, where basically all the Eastern European countries needed Soviet troops on their soil to stabilize the regimes. The North Koreans did not need that. And all those regimes, even they did not have nuclear weapons, they had Soviet troops on its soil, and all of these troops had nuclear weapons. There were Soviet weapons, but yeah. And the same we had actually on the Western side. I mean, West Germany was not a nuclear country, but it was heavily nuclearized thanks to the West troops. Now in the Korean Peninsula, the North Koreans, from their perspective, you had South Korea with American troops, later with nuclear weapons. Then you have North Korea without any foreign troops, without nuclear weapons. And this might maybe explain one of the explanations for their quest to get some sort of self-reliant security in nuclear terms. And this is why they backed the Soviets as hard as they could. And the Soviets refused to do so, and then as you might have known and certainly I'm sure it's in your paper all that they tried to shop for nuclear weapons everywhere behind the back of the Soviets but as long as the Soviets were there the Soviets found out and they stopped it wherever they could in their tracks any other questions yes Nick uh, first I'd like to salute our panelists and the Korea Initiative and the Cold War International History Project uh, once again. I'm not a historian, but I am an interested consumer and the quality of the materials is always just so top rate. I really enjoy it. I have a, uh, I have a question and a comment. A uh, question maybe to Catherine, but to any of the other panelists and uh, an observation. Um, the question has to do with this document number four, Pak Song Chol's uh, description, uh, entreaty to the Soviet Foreign Ministry about the possible uh, desirability of nuclear weapons for DPRK in August of 62. Uh, Catherine, as you pointed out, the timing seems very important there, not only because this predated um, the, uh, the Cuban crisis, but also because it predates the DPRK December 62 plenum where the all fortressization of uh, policy was laid down that uh, went on and on and on as long as the North Korean economy was capable of supporting it. Um, you know, the, the kind of the, what I think of as some of the classical historical texts, you know, Sadeh Sook or uh, Lee Chung Shik and uh, Bob Scalapino, uh, put a lot of emphasis upon the importance of the Cuban crisis in leading to the uh, in leading to the all fortressization and subsequent militarization policy. When you see a document like this, how does that how does that does that at all modulate your assessment of the importance of the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, or do you see other things here as well that may have predated that? Um, an observation that doesn't require any comment in case any, unless anybody cares to. Um, it, it seems to me that we also should never underestimate the extent to which uh, politics is personal. And uh, it is, it's interesting to note that Soviet DPRK nuclear cooperation really couldn't proceed very far until uh, Lenin Brezhnev was dead and buried. Uh, it was, was actually in the ground. 
um, my impression is that Brezhnev uh, knew Kim Il-sung very well, knew the DPRK regime very well, and harbored a deep and personal loathing for both of them, uh, being informed in the first instance by his um, fateful or unfortunate assignment as the Soviet delegate at the Third uh, Korea Workers' Party in 56, where he gave that uh, could you please die now? Speech to uh, <laughs> uh, to, to, uh, to Kim Il Sung. Uh, it, it's it, it's noticeable that he had hard that the big warming up in Soviet DPRK relations took place more or less as his body was cooling to room temperature. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And yes, please. Um, I'd like to echo the words uh, said so far um, about the project uh, and uh, the value of today. Could, could you please um, identify yourself? Yes, I'm Michael Yehuda, a new fellow here at the Center. Uh, it seems to me, though, that there is a sense in which um, looking at the two careers and their alliances, there's a tendency to suggest that there are similar processes going on. That is to say, the problems of being allied to the great world powers provides an equivalence to the South Koreans on the one side and the North Koreans on the other. But I think uh, one of the things that comes out from the history project is really how different uh, the Soviet Union's relationships with its allies mm -hmm. have been from the American relationships with, with its allies. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think it's true to say that uh, all the alliances that the Americans have signed uh, since the, the end of the Cold War have still survived to this day, although one could argue they're fraying in all sorts of different ways and need all kinds of redefinitions. So in, in some respects, therefore, the predicament of the Soviet allies has always been sharper and always been much more problematic. And um, even when the, the uh, American president uh, decided that he would withdraw troops from, from, from the South, uh, the, because of, of the, uh, I suppose, the democratic nature of decision making within the United States, uh, the, the decision was, was revoked. Whereas uh, I think the, uh, uh, the Soviet alliances uh, never really worked. And the only real alliance that the Soviet Union had that worked in a way was the less formal one that it had with India. <laughs> uh, but, but otherwise, all the others, uh, I think without exception, have failed uh, in one form or another. And so, in that sense, that it should fail with, with the North Koreans should, shouldn't be seen as, uh, uh, as truly exceptional. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so from that point of view, in trying to draw um, comparisons about self-reliance, nature of alliances, I, I think we, we have to be very careful in, in how we draw the comparisons. Um, yeah, let me respond to both of you. Um, yes, I remember in uh, some of the discussions of Cold War history in the early 90s when, when archival sources were first coming out, uh, one of the questions that, that, that was raised repeatedly, and I remember raising it myself, was, uh, you know, why was it that uh, throughout the Cold War the Soviets never succeeded in establishing a successful alliance with any country with the possible exception of India. <laughs> um, certainly not with any ally within its own camp. Um, it's very striking. I, I think it goes to the root of the problems of the communist system. But one way we might kind of use that observation, I think, for a discussion of the subject we're looking at today is that being the case, um, that can sort of shed some some you know really useful light on the ways in which um, the alliance dilemma was similar you know so that d 
despite um, the characteristics of relations between communist states, um, still, in the case of North Korea's dealings with the Soviets and the Chinese, um, we see um, essentially the same uh, predicament, and, and we see some of the same ways of attempting to resolve that predicament. So I think maybe keeping both of those things in mind can, can um, put things in, in a bit sharper relief. Uh, Nick's question about the Cuban Missile Crisis um, yeah, I mean, my response to that would be to say that what we see in August 62 is a statement of the basic logic, if you will, of you know, nuclear deterrence. Um, um, a very strong argument against prolifera uh, non-proliferation efforts. You know, it's, it's expressed rather crudely and because it's a you know, rather crude assessment of you know, basic um, power relations. Um, what we see following the Cuban Missile Crisis, however, is in addition to that, a kind of urgency and a kind of um, focus on um, the ability of the Koreans themselves you know, uh, to build these weapons, despite ha being nowhere near having the capability economically or technologically still the urgency is so great that they are claiming that simple willpower, you know, willingness to work for free, you know, is enough. Um, there, in, in another document, um, a North Korean is saying um, to, to, to a Soviet, well, um, we can survive a nuclear war because we have all of these underground um, facilities that we've built. And uh, the you know the Soviet counterpart, you know, poo poo's then says, look, you know, that, that is, that's not true. It's not going to work. And the North Korean bristles and said, you know, Kim Il Sung tells us that we won the war of 5053 because of our ability to dig underground, and so therefore, you know, it's true, and uh, we we can prevail again. So there's a a kind of you know focus on on their own capabilities despite uh, not having you know, what is obviously really needed. Um, and this urgency, as, as Berndt said, shopping around, going to the East Germans, going to the Hungarians, going to the Czech, going to anybody, eventually going to the Swiss, as I've been told, Canada, right. France, yeah, everybody. Right. Um, so that's, that's the way I would answer that. Yes, uh, Professor Ma, you have some answers to give? Well, uh, regarding Professor Yahuda's comments on the uh, comparison, well, or, or incom incompatibility between the U.S. alliance systems and the Soviet alliance system, I might add that the South Korean leaders uh, during, especially during 1960s and 70s, were quite well aware of the benefits of being uh, uh, allies of the United States. And that's why he, despite uh, his, uh, he, uh, Park Jung, his value system was totally different from that of the uh, liberal democracies like the United States. And he even uh, was, uh, wrote in his uh, book, published in 1962, that Americans are very uh, well helpful uh, well for the uh, for the survival of the this country. But uh, he warned that the uh, compo well imposing uh, the American values, uh, political values like uh, democracy and human val human rights, are not uh, welcome because it, it it those values are not Koreans and. Uh, I believe uh, this, this part, uh, this kind of uh, uh, cultural um, uh, differences and differences in values, political values, uh, Park Chung hee clearly was aware of the necessity and benefits of being still remaining as a, an ally of the United States. And as I repeat uh, my well, comment, well, answer to uh, Dr. Kong, o Kong uh question, I think, well, this is the time that the South Koreans, well, be already being uh, a very developed country, 
uh, with a large economy and well sophisticated uh, technological uh, well qualities. This is uh, might be the timing that uh, uh, South Koreans now uh, develop another or just upgrade an another uh, well alliance uh, qualitatively different from that of Park Jong Hee era. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we have some more minutes. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Roy Kim from Philadelphia, a professor of Benign economics from Drexel University, advisor for Congress Kirk Weldon, who traveled twice to uh, Pyongyang, 03 and 05. Uh, and we've been working very closely with North Korea. Uh, my comments, I'm very sorry I was late coming here. And I wanted to come earlier, but uh, I had uh, other engagement. And I'm glad to see a few familiar faces. And the uh, question dealing with uh, self-reliance dealing with North Korean nuclear power, nuclear program. If you examine uh, Don Oberdorfer's definitive study, in the very thick book, he mentioned the two important sources of North Korea's nuclear uh, program. One from Russian side, the Kochatov Institute in Moscow, that was established by Igor Kochatov, who was uh, the founder of the Soviet ABAM, and there were many North Koreans trained there. The second source he mentioned is uh, Yi Sung-gun. Professor Yi Sung-gun was trained and PhD from Imperial University of Tokyo. Yeah. In, in Tokyo. Imperial University of Tokyo. And he, retur he returned to SNU and became uh, the dean of SNU's engineering college up to 1949. Then he went to Pyongyang. And he began to very serious physics research. This was especially funded by, funded by Kim Il-sung and he maintained the very close relations. And the question is still coming back. So which factor was more important? Was it Kachatov Institute, North Koreans trained there, or Isang Gun? In my own way of thinking, of the two, those trained from the Kachatov was under Professor Lee's direction in Pyongyang. So there's very important element one, would not, one should not neglect. One should not overemphasize the Soviet link. It is true that the Soviet provided the blueprint of two nuclear power plants in Kumho. That was before the collapse. In fact, uh, Kedo used that formula. But when it comes to actual in input by the Soviet size, that should not be overemphasized. In short, it was very much a homegrown process. That's very important. Now, the second you know, uh, 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 idea is that the Soviet role in North Korea. Uh, I still remember my visit to Pyongyang in August and September uh, 1979. And that was the first unexpected visit on my part, invited by Kim Dal-hyun. And uh, it was uh, actually from Habarovsk. I was attending a meeting in Habarovsk at the invitation of uh, Evgeny Primakov. Uh, and in the course of my visit, I was invi invited, and I did not hesitate to attend a uh, September 9 meeting in Pyongyang, 1979. You mentioned Park Sung Chol. There he made very important speech. If any of you like to be serious about North Korean studies, I urge you to go back to check the Northern Shinmen and his speech. It came out in September 10, 1979. 
I was attending there. I was I couldn't believe my ears. Then later I asked my guide, can I have a copy of that in English? And they did better. They arranged the meeting, Park Sung Chol and myself. I had two hours discussion with him. It was the most revealing understanding what was going on. So that in a sense was the beginning of Pyongyang's reaching out to Washington. There's a subsequent uh, development. So I cannot go into detail. Another very important event happened. This was uh, in the fall of 1989. In the course of uh, very serious problems in Moscow. The Shrebanaze visited Pyongyang, as you remember. This was a very important visit. And Shrebanaze's desire to visit uh, Man Jong was denied. And later, Shrebanaze showed up in Vladivostok, and also attending the meeting there. And there was a tremendous expectation. Why? He did not go to Man Jung there. At that time, this was attended also by Kim Young Sam from Seoul. And he was to meet with the counterpart from Pyongyang. That did not materialize. That's another story. But the point was that this was attended by key people from Pyongyang, just to name a few Egan, Peng Nam Sun, and others. They were very, very angry at the Soviet Union. They almost left the meeting. But at the persuasion of Brimakov, they stayed on. So the very, very interesting discussions with both Brimakov as well as Egan, of course today he's one of the key members, who are attending six party members, as well as uh, Ken Nam Sun, who is now uh, 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 the, the foreign. foreign minister of DPRK. So there are very interesting aspects. Uh, so it, it's really all this detailed stuff which we really have to examine. This is a very good time to do it. I very much welcome your universities hosting this event here in Washington. Uh, maybe later during the break I can say some more, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Actually, the Professor Kim or Roy described the wedding very beautifully without showing the bride. Means what Park Sung Chul said in that meeting, can you summarize with one sentence? <laughs> Instead of me going to the Library of Congress and reading the 1979 Nodong Shinmun, what did he say? Well, actually, uh, his idea, you're talking about Park Sung Chul's speech. Right. Yeah, okay. Uh, there was a time I was uh, asked to pick any place I wanted to go. I couldn't believe it. No, the question is what did Park Sung I will explain. Say? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Simple. Uh, so I said that I wanted to go to uh, back to San. I wanted to go to Pyongyang San. So they took me both places. Why do I mention this? When I went to Gungwang San, there was a sign which really said in Russian, which they erased, and they, they put hot spring in English. To me, that was a very clear sign <laughs> of the changing whole process. That gets back to Park Sung Sung's speech. If you read the speech, he was reaching out. He said, we are ready to improve relations with the United States. In fact, in my private meeting with him, he asked me, Professor Kim, tell me how we could do that. He said, we tried to reach out to the administration. It didn't work. I said, that's not the right approach. You are part of Supreme People's Assembly. And I also had a meeting with Yang 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 and they asked me to help out. So I ended up drafting their proposal to Jim Wright, then the Speaker of the House of the United States. 
of course, in rape because of his controversy with the Pope, he had to resign. Uh, this is one more thing I forgot to mention, if I may. Uh, uh, this has to do with the uh, 1964 uh, speech by Kim Il Sung in Indonesia. There was a time when Kim Il Sung went there to receive honorary degree from Suhano, 10th anniversary of the Bandung Conference. At the time, his uh, bodyguard was none other than Kim Jong Il. If you read this speech again, he made very important point. He compared the United States as octopus, stretched out to many, to many different places. So he proposed the thing to do is cut off those legs of the octopus. That's the way to deal with it. And if you think about today, the problem to the United States, Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, Lebanon, I always go back to the speech by Kim Il-sung. And of course, of course, that was at the height of the Bandung spirit and non-aligned movement. Of course, even without any connection among the countries, non-alignment, Nasser, Nehru, uh, and Egypt, and of course, in the case of Tito uh, Yugoslavia, it's not the, link, the problem of link, the problem of spirit, how to deal with the United States. And that speech, again, was very significant. I hope I answered the question. Well, uh, I thank once again our two speakers and two commentators. And I thank you all of you for participating in the discussion in panel two. So I suggest that we conclude panel two and we will have 15 minutes coffee break before mm -hmm. starting the panel three. Thank you very much. Thank you.